Take your CJ7 all the way to 11. Jeepers with cool guys. On today's episode of Jeepers with Cool Guy, we are going to reassemble the AMC 20 rear axle configuration. The AMC 20, it is by no means one of the best axles on the market. Actually, it's really not all that great. The reason it's not all that great is because it's a two-part axle. And when I say a two-part axle, I mean that the axle shaft and the hub are two completely separate pieces. Why is that a problem? Because the way that it was engineered, this hub is held onto and engaged with the axle shaft by two pretty small things. One is this Woodruff key that is cut into a slot. Here's how small that Woodruff key actually is. I mean, this is my thumbnail. That's the Woodruff key. And that's the slot that it's in. The other part is the splines that are cut into the axle. If you are replacing this hub, then you're going to have to machine press this thing back on. Because what happens is, is that the splines on the axle cut into and create that spline connection with the hub. If you are or reassembling your original hub with your shaft, then you don't have to worry about that, which is what my case is. One of the drawbacks, well, I'm sure there's a few drawbacks, but one of the main drawbacks is the this Woodruff key and spline configuration with the hub isn't very strong. So if you go and you make a modification to your CJ, you put in like a 401 or a 360 or a Ford something something, um, because you, you want to drag race your Jeep or whatever it is that you want to do, you're going to have to change out your back axle for a couple different things. Either you're going to have to put in a one-piece axle or you're going to have to switch up and have a completely different axle because the scenario that comes along is, and you may have heard somebody mention it once or twice, their rear hub or their real axle is spun. What that means is, is that there is, there's too much torque having been put on the axle and the hub and this Woodruff key just gets shaved off. And then your hub is free spinning. So the axle's spinning, and it's not engaging with the, uh, the hub anymore because that, ax that Woodruff key is gone, cut through, and these splines are not strong enough to hold that together. So enough of all of that backstory. To take this axle hub off of this axle itself, you're going to have to have a 20 ton press. Um, we've got the Harbor Freight, I think it's 12 ton one, and it wouldn't budge. Um, you're, it takes a serious amount of uh, force and pressure to press off this hub from this, the axle because of the way that the splines are cut into the hub on assembly originally. So I had to actually take mine to a machine shop, which is kind of annoying, but they got it off, everything's good. I see a lot of people ask questions about how do I get the, the bearing off, because the bearing on my rear axle is done. Well, to do that, you have to have the, the hub pressed off. There's no other way around it because there is a uh, flange on this axle that the bearing rests against. That flange is right here. So I have already used my press to install the pre-greased bearings. I did these, I greased them by hand. I used a Mobile One synthetic uh, bearing grease, um, but you wanna make sure that you really pack these things well before you press them on. Let's carry this stuff out into the garage, but before we do that, I'm gonna put the original wheel studs back into the hub. 
you can press these in if you want, uh, but it's really easy to just do this with a hammer. Um, you can put the, uh, the hub on a fairly flat surface and just take a hammer and just tap this thing in and it will re-groove itself into the hub and you should be good to go. Now we're going to put the axle shaft assembly together with the brake backer plate seals and the wheel hub. I've already taken one of the steps and I did this a few weeks ago so I apologize for not filming it and I'll show it to you but there is an inner oil seal that rests right on the inside of this axle flange. If you take a real close look at your axle you'll notice that at the very end of it here last two inches give or take is actually tapered out a little bit and that creates a inner area where the oil seal will rest. This is the inner oil seal. I went with the Yukon Mighty Seal. Got it off of Rock Auto. Uh, once you get this installed, and you're going to want to use a obviously a, a bearing and a seal punch. Um, the one that I found to be the right size for this is a 59 millimeter. You just tap that in, get it seated. And then once that is seated, you're going to want to run um, a nice layer of axle grease or uh, bearing grease, seal grease. Um, I'm using this Mobile One full synthetic chassis grease. Now we're ready to insert the axle shaft. And the one thing that you want to make sure that you do uh, before you install this, because there's no way of doing it afterwards, is to make sure that you've got your bearing very well greased up. I'm going to use the, the same Mobile One bearing grease as before and make sure that I've got this packed really, really well. Alright, now that I've got that sealed up as well as I can, then I'm going to insert the axle shaft into the oil seal slide it all the way in to where you feel it just starting to mesh with the inner pinion gears and then once I get those teeth, met, teeth meshed then slide it as far as I can in after you get that in then take your cup or bearing race and you want to insert that with the tapered in pointing in. Well, I apologize. Um, <laughs> it didn't record. And then grab a, either like a dead blow hammer or a ball peen hammer, something that is kind of a soft metal with a rounded edge. Um, or you could use like a, a plastic end um, hammer and just tap that race all the way in until it is flush with the the flange of the axle. Now we're going to install the brake support plate or the brake backer plate. But before we do that, uh, there's something that I will, I've been trying to figure out what people say when they talk about end play on the axle shaft. Having read through the manual, uh, trying to figure out exactly what it means. My gathering on a layman's term is that the in play is the amount of space, a lot of space that the axle can move, the axle shaft can move in and out from the actual axle housing. Maybe that's correct, maybe it's not, I don't know. But to alleviate that or to accommodate that, they have these shims, and they're very, very thin shims. Um, I kept the original three that I took off of this, and the, the other thing to note is that these shims can only be used, or only supposed to be used, on the driver's side. What that tells me is that the, the race and the bearing for the passenger side should fit 
perfectly flush with the flange on the axle. And these shims are supposed to accommodate the cup on the, the driver's side so that it fits snugly with the, the backer plate. That's my best understanding of it. So to try and figure this out, I went ahead and installed the passenger side axle bearing and the, the cup or the race and seated that flush because I wanted to see what would happen if I did that. And by doing that and making sure that it's all flush on that side, I, I don't have any movement, any play on the axle. I've already spun the, uh, the, the spindle just to make sure that it's nice and smooth and nothing's binding up. So I'm in a good place there. So I guess that's the only reason that these shims exist. You may need them, you may not. Now with all that said, I, I couldn't find anywhere that explained it in a layman's terms. So that is my best understanding of it. What I'm going to ask you from the community is that if you are much more knowledgeable about this and actually are able to articulate how the in-play is supposed to come about, please put it in the comments and help all of us figure out what exactly it's, what in-play means and what we're accommodating for with these shims. One of the things it is recommended that you use a little bit of RTV or sealant around the, uh, the flange on the axle just to provide a little bit more of a waterproof seal and a little bit of a dust shield. I don't really think it's going to do much for the dust shield because when you have the shims on here and the backer plate on here, it's going to pretty much provide a uh, dust shield by itself. Um, but I think it might be a little bit more for the, the water. And um, you're definitely going to want to put the RTV on the passenger side flange because there are no shims and that will help create a seal between the backer plate and the flange on the passenger side. Putting on the shims, then I'm going to take my backer plate. These backer plates, one, nobody makes them. So the only way that you're going, if, if this thing is right out, you're just going to have to find somebody that has a set of them. Uh, and they also come in two different sizes, depending on the rear brake size of your CJ. There is 10 inch rear brakes, and there is also 11 inch rear brakes. These are the 10 inch rear brake backer plates. And they're also stamped as to what side they're supposed to go on. So this one, these are apparently all made by Bendix. And this one is stamped 324324L, designating as the left side. Other side, passenger side, would be the right side. Before we put the backer plate on in the shims and anything else, take your mounting bolts. Um, these happen to be kind of an interesting shape. Um, I do know that they are uh, grade 8, um, but they are the original bolts that I took off this hub. Um, they have this uh, very interesting head to them. And now that I'm looking at it, the reason that they have these heads is so that this bolt never turns. Because what it does is it, it locks in on the, the back of the, or the axle tube so the thing can't spin. So it, it, it's interesting because in a way it's a uh, um, lock nut head. Anyways, go ahead and install all four of these. You only need four. There is a hole at the bottom of the axle flange that operates as a drain hole that uh, is also on the, the shims, the backer plate, and the oil seal. Okay. Now, we can install our shims. And our backer plate. And our oil seal. That this is the, the bottom drain hole that I was just mentioning. Make sure that that points towards the bottom. 
And then, last but not least, your dust shield. If you have replaced your dust shield, um, and it doesn't look exactly like this because yours is poly steel, um, note I powder coated this like I did the backer plate in pretty much everything else that I could get on here because, hey, I don't want the rust out anymore. Now, we want to install our lock washers and our nuts, the nylon walk nut, lock nuts. My only concern about the nylon walk, lock nuts um, in a brake configuration is that this stuff kind of gets a little warm sometimes, especially if you're using your brakes a lot. And that nylon is going to wind up getting soft. Um, and then it could unthread itself. So my recommendation is to use uh, just a, a stainless steel lock nut, uh, washer and then a regular nut. These are actually 3 8 inch bolts uh, with the fine thread count, which I think is a 24. So I've got the stainless steel lock washer on there and I'm putting on the stainless steel nut to go with it. These are supposed to be torqued down to 32 foot-pounds. That cracks me up. I mean, 32 foot-pounds. Where'd you come up with that number? Not 30, not 35, but 32. If you go 33, might be too much. Might be go 31, not, not, not enough. 32, okay. I'm going to go in a crossing pattern for this, just like you would put on your wheel. Now, we're going to go ahead and install the hub. So you want to take your Woodruff key, put it down into that slot, give it a little bit of a tap, 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 just tap it in, just tap it in. And set down in there far enough to where it's not going to push back on this and make it more difficult to get in there. And then you want to align the slot that's uh, cut into your wheel hub, obviously, with that Woodruff key. Then I'm going to take a long shafted impact socket, just big enough to fit over the actual axle threaded end. So the 20, 22 inch, or 20, 22 inch, 22 millimeter socket. All right, you can hear it seat in there. This gives you a duller thud when you hit the hammer on it. I'm starting to wonder if this is what they mean by in play, is this part right here. If uh, instead of the in play being in and out, I wonder if the in play is rotationary. Um, even so, that is there's not much there either way. I mean, there's nothing going this way, but that way, eh, not too bad. Tolerances are supposed to be really minute. I'll have to look those up. I'll put it in the description if I f figure them out. You're gonna go ahead and install your washer and your crown nut and torque this thing down to two. 150 foot pounds. 250 foot pounds. Okay. Yeah. I, I can't wait to see how I'm going to do that. Um, so, really, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to wait and put the, the rear brakes back on, get the whole wheel assembly put back into place, get the the tires mounted on this um, and then maybe block the tires and then use uh, my torque wrench which only goes up to 150 foot-pounds uh, and then try and figure out how to get that on there. I, I mean I don't even weigh that much. How in the world am I going to be able to put that much torque on there? So uh, that's pretty much the, the gist of this um, video. We've got the, the hub on, everything's put in place. If you do want to see how to put the rear brakes on, install the rear brakes, I already have a video for that on my channel. The one thing I will 
uh, preface you watching that video with is that um, there is a difference between the front and the back brake shoe um, that I didn't address in that video. But if you pay attention to the comments in there, you'll see what I'm talking about. Anyways, uh, another great episode of Jeeper with Cool Guy, and look forward to the next one.